Hey guys, just Little Magic here, and if you've been watching my channel for a while now, you know for about the last four or five years, so in other words, the entire life of my channel, I've been saying that uh, speculators, MTG finance people, and investors, and I don't mean the good ones like store owners or you know online business owners, I mean the douchebags, the day trader wannabes, you know, those people, um, they've been pretty much just selling, you know, reserve list cards and expensive stuff in Power 9 to each other, and it's all just like, a bunch of popsicle sticks built into a, a, a beautiful replica of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, but it's pretty fragile. It's actually worse than if it was held together by bubble gum. It's actually held together by bullshit. The only thing that's keeping it collapsing are them lying to each other and themselves about there being any demand for these cards whatsoever. More people are leaving Legacy and Vintage than are playing it, and that little tiny bump from Wizards adding Legacy to whatever the hell they did, GP or whatever, I don't even know. Cool, great. Uh, now, I, I do believe that's over with. I think that was a one-year thing. I don't know. You guys know I don't cover uh, the pro magic or whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah, anybody who studied economics at like the middle school level probably has heard of the case study of the tulips. It's usually titled Tulip Mania or Tulip Fever. You're probably thinking, oh no, what other plague did the Chinese start now? But no, this happened in 1637. It's a pretty looking flower. It came over from the Ottoman Empire in the late 1500s. And uh, people were like, oh, this is a cool looking thing. I kind of want it. Rich people were like, oh, I could buy tulips. They're a little expensive, but it's a way to show wealth. So then, you know, the price went up. The price went up because there's only limited supply. I mean, you know, they, they grow from bulbs, which is, you know, hard to get. And then uh, you got speculators who would like say, oh, these are kind of hot. You know, maybe I'll buy up some and sell them. And then they, uh, well, the supply ran dry. So the people that wanted to speculate on them, in other words, uh, merch them, as we used to call it in RuneScape, you buy them and resell them at a higher price which is what most businesses do. They just started buying them from each other. And then the, the demand was like 90% investors, 10% rich people with gardens. So the bulbs themselves, which is what you plant and turns into the flower. Well, they're seen as a, a, a pretty solid investment because one, people actually wanted them. They look great. And they're kind of exotic and foreign, you know, sellable. And then you throw them into the ground. They grow, assuming, you know, nothing bad happens to them. And eventually you'll get an identical bulb, I believe in the center. And I'm no botanist, but then you get like a uh, little what do they call them, buds around the outside that, if cultivated correctly, would turn into bulbs. So if you bought one, you could enjoy it as a flower, and then, ta-da, you've got, like, I don't know, seven bulbs or something from the one. So it was, like, a really smart investment. And also, like, it took a while, so it's not that people could just, like, you know, explode it, like uh, like strawberry seeds or corn or something. I mean, if something was hot with, like, corn, you know, you take one seed and it turns into, oh, gosh, I would think at least 500. In one growing season... And then no matter how high demand went, I mean, supply would way overwhelm it and it would just crash because people would, you know, see money and then all be wrong. Well, you couldn't really do that with tulips. It was too slow. So people are like, this is the gold investment writer. This is amazing. Which people were like, yeah, I mean, I'll drop, you know, whatever. I mean, I'd say a thousand bucks, but this is like the year 1600. I don't, I don't even know what currency they used, honestly. And it's the Netherlands. <laughs> My people. You might be thinking at this point, how many different backgrounds do you have? Because I just watched the last video. I'm half German, a quarter Irish, and a quarter Dutch. Just like everybody else in Wisconsin. Oh, except for, you know, my Polish homies, they're here too. So now tulips were being exported from the country because they were being highly cultivated. There was demand internationally. And, uh, oh my gosh, 1636 to 1637, they're changing hands 10 times a day. People are, like, leveraging real estate and, like, houses and... Okay, that's the same thing, but, like, land... Entire savings account, entire fortunes, because everybody was like, well, this is hot. It's only ever gone up. Oh, yes, as we all learned in the everything ever. I mean, the, the housing boom, the stock market crash, the interest rates in the 80s, like name anything. But as we all learned a million times, um, stuff doesn't go up forever because people don't have unlimited money. If it goes up faster than inflation, that's called a warning sign, and you better have gotten on that train early enough or you better jump off, and that's what people are starting to realize. They finally uh, started to try to liquidate some of these. People are like, yeah, I want to cash out. I'm retiring. I need this. Or, you know, Somebody's having a wedding. I need a house. Whatever. I'm going to try and sell this bulb, which, by the way, they were like selling interest in bulbs, like the bulbs were stored. They weren't even like in hand. It was like an ownership deed to the tulip bulbs. But they were looking to, like, actually sell the bulbs, and then they realized, oh, wait a minute. It turns out nobody wants to pay the cost of, like, a horse for one flower. Hmm. Oh, crap. The only people buying these are other investors, and that's the only reason it's going up, and they should be 100 times lower in price than they actually are. Whoops. So the early people saw the writing on the walls, and they tried to just 
offload them to other investors, maybe for like a real good deal. I mean, remember when you've got a toxic asset, you're willing to take like a smaller profit or even a small loss on it because it's better than losing it all. You know what I mean? But enough people started getting a word of mouth like, hey, this just sold lower. Hey, the price looks like it's dropping. Hey, are there any people actually buying these bulbs like to use them? Well, it turned out none of them were actually leaving the country. None of them were going to the ground and, and none of them, unless they were purposely being split into multiple bulbs, were, were being planted. Like I said, it was like 99.9%, .9%, if not 100%, just investors selling to each other and speculators selling to each other on the premise that, oh, don't worry, people are actually buying them and using them for this price. There was no demand and no market for that product at all. Not at that price. And then uh, when there was a big like thing where you would auction off the ownership of them and like literally nobody showed up to the auction, then it was like, okay, full blown panic mode, it crashed and everybody lost their ass. It was like hot potato who was left holding the tulip. Um, they were screwed because it was worthless. If you could sell it for anything cool, cause, because uh, it's hard to find exact prices, but as far as we know, um, they went from like. I'll just say a dollar. I don't know what the hell it was. I don't remember what the currency was called in the 1600s. And it hit just short of 200. Well, and then between February and May, it dropped back down to about a dollar. And, uh, well, honestly, between February 3rd and February 9th, it went from 200 bucks to like 150. Ouch. So what's the takeaway from Tulip Mania? People buying and selling something that's absolutely exploding and going up in price and consistently doing well. And it looks, everything looks great. If that's propped up on just, yeah, it makes sense that there's a demand for it. Why would there be? I mean, look at this. This is a valuable item. It's not even expendable. You don't just use it. It grows into more of itself. It's the perfect product. It's pretty looking, and after a while, if you're not lazy, you get your money back because you get multiple bulbs from one. Ta-da. What a perfect product. It has inherent value. It is a solid investment. I mean, guys, there's only so many uh, cards on the reserve list that are playable in some deck list somewhere, and there's never going to be more of them, ever. They are never producing more of them. But people still need them. If people still need them, but they're never making any more, and some are lost or destroyed every day, or just taken off the market permanently because somebody just builds a deck and they, they intend to keep it forever, they have no intention of selling it. Well, it's guaranteed to go up. I mean, what a perfect investment. Look at that. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, yeah, people stop playing the format and stop needing it. The demand falls out. I mean, look at what happens to Standard. I always use this example when Kaladesh came out, uh, Red White Vehicles was the bomb at Star City Games, and then by the time the Pro Tour rolled around, people tried to play with it, stupid net decking followers tried to go to a freaking Pro Tour and run that garbage. They got their asses kicked by what was actually the best decks in the world, and for like a week, the price of every card that was related to vehicles and stuff went up and then right back down. And people thought, well, clearly this will never go down. This is the most powerful deck. Look at this proof. Absolute perfect investment. What could ever happen? Well, the meta could shift like a tiny little bit and then nobody wants it. Welcome to magic. If anything changes, a ban announcement, an unban announcement, a new card that comes out. A new card that comes out could affect legacy and vintage. Okay. It, it has. I mean, look at the last two years. If you're only looking at the upsides, you don't look at the downside of any investment in any card in any format in the entire history of magic. Anything. Anything is on the table as potentially falling down the toilet. Well, then, you know, looking at the positives like, oh, they're never going to make any more. They're never going to print more, but people need them and they're disappearing and the game's being more popular and all this. No, you got to look at the downsides, too. This is not a bulletproof investment. If it was... I mean, more people would jump on it than people could even afford, which honestly is kind of where we're at now, but it could get worse. So for at least the last 10 years, in my opinion, people have just been speculators selling to other speculators. They buy a card for 30, it hits 80, they sell it. And somebody else is like, wow, look at this amazing history of it going from 30 to 80. I'll pay 80. And then it gets to 100. Then they sell it because they either need the money out of it for another investment or they just want to move off of that uh, property. They think they got something better. They don't want to risk it. They think it's high enough, whatever. And then they sell it to somebody for 100 and then oh, all of a sudden it hits 110, 120. And people are like, oh, look at this. I made a good investment. Yay me. Wait a minute. Is anybody actually physically playing the game with paper cards willing to pay 120 for that card? In fact, times four, probably. You know, possibly for a playset. Like if people only need one of, like why is it so expensive? So if, if it's rising that high, people probably need multiples. Oh, the answer is no. Oh, there's an alternative. Oh, you know, nobody plays that format enough. Oh, there's really only like 10 people building legacy decks in the entire world right now or something. Oh, uh-oh. Better trick some other dumbass into buying it. 
You know what? Maybe I'll liquidate it for 110. It's 120, but if I get rid of it for 110, I can get rid of it right now. And we've got the tulip crash because people are like, hey, wait a minute. There's, those are public sales records. You can look at sales history on eBay and say, why did that sell for 110 instead of 120? Oh crap, now somebody sold one for 105. Now somebody's moving, you know, eight of them at 85 a piece. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And as soon as people see that, within days, it's the same as Tulip Mania. Just one week in February, which uh, ironically it is right now, by the way. I, I didn't even realize that. That is really funny. Once everybody who's holding these sees, oh crap, there's no real demand at that price. It's a third rate deck. Ooh, only a couple commander people are buying this and they sure shit ain't gonna pay above 10 bucks for it. Uh-oh, now it doesn't really matter that they're never printing anymore because nobody wants them at that price. There's no actual demand. There's no real, actual, factual, true end customer demand for that product. And then, boom, watch it go off a cliff. It's like that Yodler game on, on The Price is Right. As soon as you hit a certain amount and then people are like, hey, wait a minute, this is really high. Bye bye Mr. Yodel Dude's going over that mountain and he ain't coming back. So I've been saying that that's going to happen to this completely artificially inflated BS market of people lying to each other and pretending that shit has value that doesn't um, for, for years. And it finally happened. I don't know if you've seen some uh, reserve list prices now, but they are crashing and uh, words getting around. I'd say we're just seeing the start of it, but looking at what cards are selling for like hundred dollar cards, $150, $200 cards going for like 30 bucks now. Uh, is it really the start of it? I mean, I guess technically they could hit like 10 or five, but it's over. It's over. Anybody holding these lost their ass. They deserve it because they are parasites. Everybody in the MTG finance community is a parasite. Okay. They, they inserted themselves as a middleman, made something more expensive, but artificially inflated it and pocketed money for doing absolutely nothing. I mean, oh, they're a, a magic card storage company. Well, good for them. I'd still prefer to have the cards in, in the hands of the players who actually need them and want them to play the game. So they added this whole meta layer to the entire card market and everything. And all they do is just suck out money from the actual players. If, if you look at it on a grand scale, where does the money come from? Where does it go? Where does it come from? Cotton Eye Joe. Oh, you knew that was coming. In my opinion, and, and in fact, honestly, they make money off the backs of the players who need the cards by artificially raising the price and they collect a, a difference in profit for doing nothing. That's not healthy for a small economic system. Just ask the U.S. federal government, what do you do when you don't want prices to get out of control on something? You just make it illegal to invest in it. All of a sudden, the price is exactly in line with demand, no spikes, no craziness, no buyouts, no shortages, no shenanigans, and just as a whole, the whole thing just goes down to where it should be. That's why in, uh, what was it, 2012 maybe, somewhere in that neighborhood, I forgot when this actually happened, I feel terrible that I forgot when this happened, but remember when gas was like 450 a gallon because all oil prices went crazy? Yeah, random ass people off the street and on Wall Street and every street are allowed to just like invest in gasoline and oil barrels that they don't, you know, have in their garage. They're just buying magical invisible barrels that allegedly exist somewhere, which I mean, I hate to refer to it as that way. They do. They verify them. They count them. But still, they're like, I now own these or I own, you know, shares in the property or whatever however the hell any of that shit works. Cool. Well, if it wasn't for them, it probably would have been back down to 40 a barrel. Oh, oil's getting more expensive. It's ruining the entire economy. Nobody could afford to drive anywhere or ship anything anywhere and any product that requires shipping, which is all of them. They're all incurring this giant expense and the entire economy is about to collapse because of it. Uh, let me just ignore everything you just said, except for oil is going up. Cool. I'm going to buy it. And then oil goes up more because I'm buying it. I fully expected the government to just step in and say, uh, it's now illegal to invest in oil. It's too important. I'm fairly sure that they have rules like that about food. You can't just like buy corn, wait for the price to go up and then like sell it, even though it's sitting in a silo somewhere. I'm like fairly sure you can't do that. A pointless bullshit that barely has an industrial, uh, usage gold. I mean, there you go. Let them do it. Who cares? But yeah, if you want something to not get out of control, don't let investors touch it. Don't let them buy and sell it because crazy crap like the tulip mania can happen. Now, let's take that example and apply it to a market that's already completely unregulated. You can literally spread lies and like pump and dump scams and insider trading and all that shit with magic cards and all of it's perfectly legal. I mean, it might be like fraud or something if you like literally lie. I don't know. But, you know, fooling somebody into a pump and dump scam with a card or doing a buyout to manipulate the market on purpose, or using insider information about the future from Wizards of the Coast staff that gets leaked constantly, allegedly, that's all perfectly legal, as far as I know. 
because it's not a registered asset and it's not a what commodity or a security back something. I don't know. I, I have a vague knowledge of how it works. I don't know the terminology. I think secured asset is the term. Anyway, so you get that Wild West free-for-all like early Bitcoin community crap where they don't even think that it's like a real currency and that it has real value. Then mix in investor shenanigans and buyouts and crazy crap. Then mix in the fact that like... Sometimes legacy is an official format at the tournaments. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's popular. Sometimes it's not. You got all these variables making stuff go up 50 to one and then back down again. Wow. Does that really still sound like a safe investment? So all the people pushing all this BS about, oh, buy the reserve list. You're always safe. It's always a good investment. Yeah. You know, something might happen, but you might walk out of your house and get struck by lightning. This is pretty much a sure thing. There's only one sure thing in magic. And that's that something's going to crash eventually. For one reason or another, someone's going to get caught holding the tulips, holding the hot potato, and they're going to get burned. And that's what's happening right now. It, it's only happening to the kind of like second tier, third tier, whatever kind of stuff. A lot of the collector's market that you wouldn't want to play with anyway. In other words, graded stuff. Or just like near mint or mint really super old stuff that's not graded, but you can tell the condition. You know, stuff where it's like, okay, it's not just I want the most bare playable whatever, just give me the damn card. It was something inside of a graded container for like, you know, 9.0 or whatever. You're like, okay, yeah, you wouldn't want to crack it open and play with it. Like, you could. That's why it still has value. You could. But, like, who would, you know? Well, you want to talk about demand crashing for a second-rate card. We're not talking Power 9 or shit that's been high for the entire history of Magic. I mean, we're talking like, oh, yeah, that card. People used to play with that, and it's on the reserve list. But currently, it's just a, a, a fringed commander card for some people. But still, I mean, graded in 9.0, it's $100. You know, always was. Those are just getting kicked in the balls right now. You want to talk about the first thing to crash? Uh, it's in a shiny container and graded. Somebody paid to have it graded and you can't play with it unless you crack it open, which would theoretically lower the value. Yeah, those are crashing because you can't play with them. Followed shortly after, in my opinion, with the cards you can play with because the graded ones are falling. You can't have a graded one priced lower than a, a playable one, even in light play condition. And those fall too, and as soon as you know it, the whole thing collapses. Yeah, I've seen some screenshots and price examples, some comparisons. It's not like, okay, the entire thing is collapsing, but like, wow, we're seeing the first signs of some really, really, really bad market conditions. But uh, to be perfectly honest, I've been warning people for years about it, and the, the market was crap before anybody realized it was crap. It was all fake. It was all lies. It was all popsicle sticks. It was all just speculators selling to each other and pretending that anything had a value or that there was any demand for the product, when in reality there was not. Oh, yeah, Tulip Mania. That's why we learned about Tulip Mania, so that we could see it coming. When people are buying and selling something that has a good value that's going up and they're buying it solely based on the fact that it has a good value and it's going up, that's not good. If you make luxury watches and like something happens to, you know, the worldwide economy, the, you know, the housing market crashes and there goes the bond market and everybody's unemployed for four years, uh, you're screwed because nobody needs watches. Uh, if your company sells rice, you're good. You know why? Because the inherent value is that people eat rice. I mean, I'd, I'd say you can't eat a watch. I'm sure if you just type man eats watch into YouTube, you know, but that's what we would call a non-nutritive item. You might see a little dip, but you'll be the last company to go to business because people need to eat. You know what I mean? It's up in the middle would be like appliances and air conditioning. You kind of need a fridge. You kind of need an air conditioner, but like need might be a little generous. It's just people would make it the last thing they go without if it breaks. Are they buying a watch or a boat or no? Well, just to remind you, you can't eat magic cards. Once again, I'm sure you could find a video. I think I've eaten a card in a video or two. <laughs> but I do lean back on the non-nutritive fact. Uh, people have jokingly but semi-seriously said you can burn them for fuel. That is true. The amount of watts, jewels, calories, whatever you want to put into it, very low compared to like wood. Which, I mean, th ironically, they're pretty much made out of wood, but still. The ash just snuff out the fire. They're a terrible fuel. So there you go. Inherent value is nothing, and um, they've all been just selling to each other with no real players buying them. And if players got to buy them, it's like, oh, okay, it's, it's an investor moving, and that's that. It's enough sales to make it look real. It's enough to, to maintain the illusion. Until, like I said, the first ones to go are the ones in those fancy little plastic cases that have the nice little grading on top. And, well, you know, secret layer is for investors, too. And the spellbook products are for investors, too, and collectors. And, you know, maybe they're going to sell that dusty old, you know, 8.5, whatever. They're going to try and clear that. Because, you know, they'd rather have some cool foil cats, you know, that just came out. Maybe they want to sell that and move on a couple copies of uh, From the Vault. You know, those uh, those Amon Cat Masterpieces look pretty good, too. 
And chances are within reason we're not going to see those verbatim ever again. Yeah, maybe maybe we should move off of those uh, older reserve list stuff and go on to some of the new collectibles now that they're pushing collector's products like crazy. I think that's what started this. That That's what you know, tapped the boulder and started it rolling down the hill. Either that or investors just wised up. They finally listened to my uh, channel. We're like, maybe I should look up like who bought and sold these and what the volume is. Oh, crap. Time to sell. But remember, when the whole market is built on rumors and, and uh, confidence... And then word gets around that, oh, look, some of these are dropping a little bit. People are like, uh-oh, sell, 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 which then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, whether it was true in the first place or not, and it crashes. But the only reason it can crash is because, once again, there is no real demand. Players don't want a 1,000 copies of these that are floating around. 950 of them or whatever are in the hands of investors. Maybe 50 can go to players that kind of wanted them. That's it. Oh crap, that's not a good solution. That that house of cards comes crumbling down, you know? And that's that's what they've been building for the last decade. That's why I've been saying year after year after year, this is such a bad investment. Do not invest in older magic cards. That's so stupid. Try to get on the new stuff. Try and get on the stuff that's underprinted. If people say it's really, really good, then don't buy it. And if people say they're not touching it, then buy it. Because when it flips and they're wrong, there's not enough to go around, or there's a you know some information they didn't know until the last second, there's an additional addition to the product. Or people just misjudged the demand, or wizards also thought it would be bad and underprinted it. That's where the guaranteed money is. That's where you're going to make money is on the new stuff immediately. There's no risk. There's no long term. It's just buy it, flip it, sell it, ta-da, done. But so many people have been doing that, and the, the profitable products have been so far few and far between. The last profitable uh, standard set was probably Oath of the Gatewatch. I mean, if you really put the bar low, maybe I'm on cat, but come on. But, you know, the Commander products, and people are like, oh, maybe this won't do as well this year because blah, 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 whatever. They raise the price five bucks and everybody moves off it. It's Commander. It's a 100-card deck. It's going to have reprints, and the guarantee going to be worth, like, 65 bucks. So, yeah, I bought, like, 10 grand worth of it, and I made, like, 2,000 profit. Literally in a day. 2,000 bucks in a day. Okay, my, my YouTube channel makes that in a month if I'm lucky. So when you get it right, you get it right. And sitting there like, I sat on this card for 50 bucks, and now it's worth 150. It's like, well, seven years went by. Still better than inflation, still better than a, co a commercial bond or a, a, a certified deposit, which are a good good thing to stack it up against. You know, yeah, if you beat 1.5% a year, pat yourself on the back, and that, that does. But at the end of the day, it took you seven years to make 100 bucks. That's why lately it's been smarter to move to the newer stuff than the older stuff, and I think people are getting rid of the older stuff because of it so that they have more money to put towards the newer stuff. Especially after UMA came out, and that was hot. That was free money. However much you could afford, that's how much money you made, period. You could sell limitless quantities of that. I bought more than my personal net worth, all property considered, plus the valuation of my business worth of that product, and then sold it in two days, and pocketed a mountain of money, which all went to the IRS. Welcome to America. But, you know, there's no withholding at YouTube, and I get 1099, and so did my other. It's 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 me. It's That's not how it normally goes. And I went up, like, tax brackets, and then estimates were wrong, and then I back out on stuff that was subsidized. It's a whole thing. I can summarize it, though, with thanks, Obama. That's that's a pretty f***ing accurate way to put it. But, uh, yeah, I, I think people see where the money is, and they go where the money is. Okay, none of this hold it forever crap. The quicker you can flip it, the better. And th the word that magic might fail at any second has been going on for about, I think, at least like 20 years now. I would say 99% of the time they were absolutely accurate in saying the game and the company might fail at any time. I mean, look at the alleged numbers of how many people they lost around like uh, Darksteel, the, the Jace thing, the Artifact Land Times, Cawblade. It got so bad and they did such nothing to fix it that they literally almost killed the entire game. And then you look at other card games where they did kill the entire game by making one or two bad decisions. Yu-Gi-Oh! They killed the game with the reprint policy and then a change in the rules and then <laughs> power creep. It's recovering. They almost lost it. But yeah, when people said Yu-Gi-Oh!'s in, in potentially the zone of completely failing, they were not inaccurate. And every time somebody says it about Magic... They're also not inaccurate. Players are currently pissed at the company. What else is new? They're always pissed at the company. Which, you know, that's not good. Have you heard of MySpace? Everybody hated it. Their code, their privacy issues, their layout, their garbage non-existent customer support. Everybody hated them. Oh, but where else are they going to go? We're the biggest. Then Facebook, boom, dead. Instantly, overnight. Goodbye. I mean, it's closer to like six months, but people left MySpace quicker than they left the Titanic. Too big, too important, too significant to fail? Um, No. Did you see what happened to Minecraft when Fortnite came out? It has since recovered, but have you seen the numbers? 
So Wizards has always been confident and stupid ignorant people believe them, but honestly the game and the company could fail at any point. It's run by morons with... The best way to summarize it is their personal politics and feelings are more important than the company and profits. Yelling at people to check their privilege and yelling about how white straight males are the worst thing ever is more important than anything else at their company. Does that sound like a smart company to invest in? Then you got no accountability, you got the wages that they pay, which are garbage. I mean, there, there is 50 reasons that the company could tip over at any second. And that if the game fails and nobody plays it anymore, that is worth the cost of the paper it's printed on. And we're talking Power 9, sealed, certified, all that. You might be able to pay 100 bucks for a 9.5 Black Lotus. You know, a year after the game doesn't exist anymore, because then just who cares? Like, what's Magic the Gathering? What even is it? Oh, I've never heard of that game. Nobody plays that. It's gone. It's discontinued. So since the game could go that way at any time, uh, you know, having a, a million dollars in, in, in a reserve list shit, probably not very smart. And I know people who owe, or owe, own way more than that. And a lot of them are smart enough to like also hold like, you know, bonds and gold and like, you know, whatever. Index funds, you know, even CDs. I wouldn't, but it depends how conservative you want to get. But still, you just need to realize that nothing is bulletproof and the first things to go are going to be the, like like I said, third tier, second tier cards that people used to play. And it's like, well, maybe it might come back. It's kind of speculative. Like right now, the demand isn't huge, but I'd want to have them if people need them. And okay, I'm going to keep the tradable playable ones in sleeves, but the ones that are, you know, in acrylic and are graded, I'm going to move those first. And that's the tip of the iceberg as we go careening off a cliff. And looking at the market, that's where we are right now. It is on the verge of collapsing. It's in the process of collapsing and it's all going to go to shit. Now, do I think like it's going to affect like high graded power nine? No people. That's, that's basically in my opinion, a different product. People need the cards to play vintage, but they're going to not buy the alpha and beta. They're going to buy like unlimited or whatever. I don't remember what was where. No dual lands were in one power nine. Wasn't like whatever. But most of those have value because it's just, okay, it's the most expensive card in the game. It's a collectible, and you'd be crazy to not buy it graded in, in a case, you know? Like Summer Magic, That's just, it's so limited. It's a prestige thing. It's a story. It's a collectible because it's a collectible. Play value is a nice, fun little thing to keep in the back of your mind, but nobody's playing with that card, and we all know it. So that's more like you're, you're buying like a piece of art. Like the, You know there's no practical use to it. But people want it because they want it because there's so few to go around and because, you know, we, we all agree that that's, you know, Black Lotus is expensive because it's the most powerful card ever printed in the history game pretty much. Like that, that reputation that is factual, not an opinion based. Okay, inherent value, sort of. Like I said, if the game goes away, that's a different story. But when it comes to, you know, cards that are 30 bucks on the reserve list, ooh, people better keep adding them to their commander deck. That's all I gotta say. And they aren't. Like I said, they're all speculators selling to each other. Yeah, so the moral of the story is if you're holding anything like that, I would get off it right now because it might even already be too late. These hyperinflated markets that are just fluffed up nonsense with no inherent value, with products that are worthless, that nobody wants. Yeah, when they go quick, they go quick. It's like throwing a match into gasoline. Yeah, blink and it's gone. So all those asshole middlemen parasite investors trying to get free money for sitting on their ass doing nothing playing video games all day and acting like they're smart and how superior they are to everybody because oh their business prowess and whatever when there is copycats using other people's research and other people's data and using their strategies and borrowing them like it's their own and then going on forums and lying and exaggerating and then on top of it trying to get insider information trying to buy it from each other starting secret groups where you trade it to just each other. And then trying to start rumors and pay people to destroy cards, that happened. Paying people to run a card at a tournament and do well. So that people see the deck list and popularize it when you already hold a thousand of the card. That has happened multiple times. The pump and dub schemes based on anonymous rumors posted on Pacebin. All the bullshit that these dishonest thieves and parasites get into... Oh, boo-hoo, do I feel bad for them. They all deserve it. They all deserve to lose every single last dollar that they're losing. World's smallest violin, I hope you put more of your money into something more stable than this crap because somebody on the internet said it was easy and you overextended yourself with money you couldn't afford. Money you didn't have. Portions of your portfolio you couldn't afford to lose. Well, that's what you get for being a wonderful mix of greedy and unwise, so I don't feel bad for anybody who lost money on this except for actual LGSs and people who actually provide like singles in, in very large quantities across the board, sell commons whether they're making you know money or not, send them out with a stamp. 
make nothing you know, on it, but it's a service. They get them out there. They're for the players. They're the owners are players themselves. They play the game. They just have the singles because they feel like they should and because they came in and maybe they even originally opened them and then they went up from a dollar to a hundred dollars and now they're holding them. Oh, but then it evaporates. Those people I feel bad for because they get caught up in this and they shouldn't have because they're providing actual value to the community. But just pure finance speculator, douchebag investors and singles hoarders, f*** all y'all. I'll make sure when I'm uh, driving to my job where I work because I also don't trust YouTube as my sole income. If I see you getting in line to go get your food stamps or whatever, I'll make sure to flip you off. You f parasite, good riddance. Yeah, I know food stamps is all digital now, shut up. So if anybody has some really good stories about people who deserve it losing their ass, leave them down in the comment section below. I'm sure we could all uh, have a good laugh about it. As we finally can afford that last card from our, our commander deck that finally crashed from 100 bucks down to 5 bucks. Hooray for us, something finally benefited the players. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next video.